Welcome to the show, everyone. It's so great to be back, and it's wonderful to see you. I'm your host and baking expert, Chef Colette, and we here at The Dough Doctor are now live. Happy Saturday, bakers. As you start dropping in, let me know where you're logging on from. And if you're watching on the replay, add that in the comments. I love to know where my bakers are beaming in from. I have an exciting show for you today. It's been, it's been a couple weeks, well, it's been more than a couple weeks since we've been live, and it's been a pretty busy time. So I'm happy to be back, happy to be healthy, and happy to start answering your questions. Thank you for the questions that you sent in this week, and just a couple announcements. For the fall, The Dough Doctor Live will be airing the first and third Saturday of every month. I'll have plenty of announcements out there. Now, I don't want you to think that I won't answer your baking questions in between, absolutely. So if you have a burning baking question, send it to me, either DM me or comment on one of my posts. I'll see it, don't worry and I will answer your question right away. I will probably save it for the next broadcast so that we can engage and enlighten everybody. Because bakers, if you've had that question, I guarantee you other bakers in the audience have had it too. And then also, I am blowing up my YouTube channel, which is called Ask the Dough Doctor. So please, if you're meandering around YouTube, and isn't that what we do on YouTube? Oh my Lord, I get lost for hours. Jump onto the channel and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. All right, that's enough announcements for now. While I go through the questions, let me know where you're logging on from and what you're baking this weekend. We'd love to know. So, let's start. Okay. The first question came from one of our bakers, Imaging Era USA. Imaging, it's a little tricky one. Imaging, Imaging, huh, USA. All right. Now, our baker has been making molten lava cakes, and she writes in that they have not been working out. And when I read this, I had a devil, the devil wears Prada moment. So luckily she sent me the recipe and bakers, if you have a recipe question, this was perfect. Send me the recipe, copy and paste it, send me the recipe you're working with and then I can answer, then I know right away. And I knew right away. So just to put you into the picture, molten lava cake is basically a chocolate cake with a gooey center. And it was invented in 1981 by the luminous French chef Michel Bra. And just like the blue sweater in The Devil Wears Prada, molten chocolate cake created at a five, uh, I don't know, three-star Michelin restaurant in France in 1981 by a storied chef has now trickled down to McDonald's. Yes, it's true. So why is this a Devil Wears Prada moment? Because when I saw the recipe, I knew instantly what was missing. Flour, not wheat flour, because molten lava cake is often sold as gluten-free. The original molten lava cake used rice flour and almond meal. Both those ingredients, especially together, gave the cake a little bit of structure. Our baker's cakes are collapsing, so that's what's going on. There's an ingredient missing, and that is rice flour and a little bit of almond meal, very small amounts, very small amounts, but enough to save the day. So I'm going to send her the website where it's basically michellebarad.com where the original recipe is 
and that's gonna be changed, that'll change everything. And bakers, if you're working with a recipe and maybe an older recipe or an incomplete recipe and the first instructions tell you to butter and flour the pan and there's no flour in that recipe, that is like a flag. So what you want to do is do a little bit more research because if there's flour in the greasing method, there's usually flour somewhere in that recipe. And if it's miss missing, that means, uh-oh, I got to do some work. I've got to do some more research because that's suspicious. So thank you for the great question. Molten lava cake is delicious. And it's something we can easily master at home. And if you like, I'll work up a recipe and create a blog post and a YouTube demo that I'll mention here on Instagram if that would be something you would like to see. So let me know, all right? Okay, I see some requests from Lot to be in, to be in a live video. And Chef, I have to apologize. I have not mastered that yet. So put a pin in that. Maybe next time, by next time, I promise, I'll have bringing you guys in mastered. All right, let's get going. So now the next question was about active dry and instant yeast. And I have them both right here. This is instant yeast. It comes in a, well, I buy it in a pound bag, which means I have to break it up. I always have a little jar at room temperature on my baking shelf and then I have the rest of it in the freezer. It's a good idea to store any yeast that you're working with, with the exception of fresh yeast or cake yeast, but that's so hard to buy, I would doubt that any of you are working with it. And then we also have active dry, any yeast we should store in the fridge or freezer. All right, so this question came in. How to substitute instant yeast how to substitute instant yeast for active dry. Is it the same amount? No, it's not. But what happens if you do use the same amount? What if you're like, you just measure out the same amount of yeast? Well, instant yeast is a little bit more concentrated. So your dough may move a little bit faster but that's about the worst thing that's gonna happen. Maybe you'll notice that it doubles in size a little bit more quickly. Ideally, we would reduce, for however much we're using active dry, we're gonna reduce the instant by 10%. Well, when we're baking at home, that's pretty technical, so I, and you could say, you could figure it out in grams, no problem. Or you could weigh it out and take out a good pinch. Boom, back in the jar. And that will probably, in a very quick and casual way, and that's okay sometimes, level the playing field as far as substituting instant yeast for active dry. All right, so we covered that one. All right, next. Peaches. Put it in the comments. How many of you had peaches this summer? I would guess almost all of you enjoyed a delicious ripe peach this summer. Maybe you made a pie, maybe you made turnovers, maybe you made ice cream, I don't know. I'm sure, because they were really luscious this year. The most of the country got a lot of moisture, so the peaches were really great. Stone fruits like moisture. What do I mean by stone fruits? Peaches, plums, apricots, and nectarines. Oh, BTW, peaches are in the rose family, just like apples, which we're gonna talk about after we talk about the peaches. I had a lot of questions about peaches in the past couple weeks. Let's talk about it. So our baker Cyrus wrote in and he said, he was asking about how do you choose P 
peaches and how do you ripen peaches? What do you do with these peaches? All right, I have thoughts. And as you bakers know, I always have thoughts. So when you're in the grocery store looking at peaches and nectarines, peaches are easier. You wanna select fruit that has a golden hue under whatever red blush it has. And where you're looking in the peach is at the shoulder, which is where up at the top by the stem where you have that beautiful indentation, right? That's the shoulder of the peach. So that's gonna tell you a lot. If it's green up there, well, if they're all green, you don't have much choice. But if you can kind of pick around and that green has become golden right at the shoulder of the peach, choose that. Now peaches and nectarines and plums ripen off the tree. They are picked rock hard and then they are shipped in, and they are put in trucks and shipped all over the country. So when you're in the market and you see nothing but rock hard peaches, that's normal. So you buy them, try to look for that golden hue. And BTW, there are red peaches, there are yellow peaches, and there are white peaches. And the, the, it's pretty much the same. Also, you wanna gently press. And ideally, there'd be the smallest amount of, of, of like softness. They would yield just just a titch. Yes, titch is a technical term. Then what you're gonna do is you're going to bring them home. Now, when peaches are rock hard, they don't have enough internal ethylene gas, which is the gas that ripens peaches. It's a natural gas. It is generated usually by other fruits like apples and bananas. That's how we can quick ripen fruits. And so we gotta help our peaches. So what you wanna do is put them in a brown bag with an apple or ideally a banana, all right? And then depending on how hard they are, you're gonna check them every day. You can do this with mangoes as well. You can do this with avocados. Um, and you, but you got to check them every day. You have to be, you can't leave them because they'll over ripen. And when they over ripen, they get woody and they get very, very strange. Once they're perfectly ripe, eat them, bake with them or refrigerate them for maybe one more day of goodness. And then you can, you can do something with them the next day. So that's the skitty on peaches. Now I have the tip of the day for you, oh my God. When I was talking to our baker Cyrus, he was telling me that he buys certain fruit from certain markets. And I admire his dedication to the ingredient sourcing so much, but I thought about it and I thought, what could streamline what could streamline that? What could help you zero in and find, you know, let's say you had that wonderful peach. What would be even more efficient? Bakers, when you get a really good piece of fruit and you're in your kitchen and you're like, this is so good, save the sticker. Take the sticker off the fruit, put it on the fridge on a piece of paper, take a picture of it with your phone, and the next time you're in that market, look for the, look for the number, open up your phone, and oh my God, because this tells the grower, and it tells if the fruit is organic or conventionally grown. A ton of information in this little barcode. So highly, highly recommend. It could save you some steps and also reassure you if the, 
the subsequent batches of peaches are from the same grower or apples or figs or whatever they are, green peppers, guess what? You're gonna get the same result, all right? It's kind of a way of, I don't know, it's a great idea. I cannot believe my little synapses fired so hard. But I um, let me know down the line if you take that piece of advice and it's working for you. And Andrea is saying, figs in our area right now, making a tart later today. This is the last couple weeks of figs, bakers. Andrea, that sounds fantastic. And uh, I cannot encourage you guys enough to buy figs. Even if you serve them with a really lovely cheese and a gorgeous bread, a sourdough or a baguette, just get some because they're, they're perfect right now. So that sounds great. All right. So now the last, the last thing, and I am going to try lives at the end of the show just to see if I can do it and uh, answer those live questions. But the last thing on the list were apples. So let me make sure I have my question correct. Um, all right. So I talked a lot about peaches today because that was the, oh, Cyrus had two more questions. Before we took our break, I did a demo on a peach galette and the recipe is on the website at bakingwithcolette.com and Cyrus made the galette and it was successful, but he noticed that there was more sugar in the galette and a little bit more water than a regular pie crust and he wanted to know why. Well, the extra sugar provides sweetness and it also makes the crust more tender because the galette we rolled out and folded over our fruit topping and it also aids in caramelization which means the crust was able to brown quickly and easily. So that's why there was more, um, more sugar in the dough and the little bit of extra water that allowed the dough to come together quick and easy and then it made it much easier to handle. The big baking word for that is extensible. The galette dough was more extensible, so it was easier to roll out easily and more easy to shape, so that's why. So Cyrus, thank you for your questions. I think I hit all the answers for you. I hope so. And then any questions from the questions, just DM me, let me know, and we'll get those answered. All right, so now we're gonna talk, we're moving into early fall, and it's going to be all about apples. So just really quickly, I wanted to talk about apples that are not good for baking, and then a little bit about apples that are great for baking, depending on where you are. Apples to avoid for baking, there are two. Now they are delicious as an eating or a salad apple if you're serving them raw, but they're awful for baking. And the reason they are is because of their high water content. So that would be um, golden, uh, red delicious apples and Fuji's. Stay away from those um, when you're baking. And if you see them used in a recipe, look at the source. Does the source have a lot of experience in baking? Because that I just wouldn't trust. Now, as we move into fall in different parts of the country, there are some boutique apples that I want you to peel your eyes for. So my bakers on the East Coast, you are looking for, and I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget, if you want a really special apple, Macaun. M-A-C-O-U-N, awesome. They have a very short season. Another really good one, Baldwin's. And then we have Gala, which we see in other parts of the country, but they're especially good on the East Coast. Cortland, and then of course, Macintosh. On the West Coast, look for Pacific Rose and Pink Lady. 
And if you ever see in the farmer's market, East Coast or West Coast, a strawberry apple, buy it. When you take it home and cut it in half, the veins in the fruit are red. You make a batch of applesauce with it, and that applesauce is the most gorgeous raspberry pink, phenomenal. And by the way, homemade applesauce is worth the effort. I don't care what anybody says. So look for strawberry apples if you happen to be in the farmer's market, whether you're on the East Coast or West Coast. They also have a very short season, but to our bakers and cook's hearts, they are just, oh my God, you cut that open, you see the red inside, unbelievable. And they have a fabulous flavor. Now for our bakers watching in Europe, from Europe, you're gonna look for Elf Star, you're gonna look for Opal, which have made their way stateside, and then in our very good apple, Cox Pippin, and of course from Italy, Renetta, fabulous. So that's our cook's tour, no pun intended, of international apples. And by the way, bakers, what did I talk about? 15 apples? There are 7,500 varieties of apples in the world. It's crazy. And before I close on apples, I have to shout out, I know it's going to be backwards because it's Instagram, but one of our bakers, Leo, sent me this wonderful book from Italy, all on Italian desserts. And everything in here is beyond, I mean, beyond gorgeous, of course. But I have to share that with you. Doesn't that make you wanna just run out and buy a mandolin? That's what I wanna do when I see this photograph. Anyway, thanks to Leo for that. All right, everyone, one last apple factoid. As of last year, 2022, the number one selling apple in the United States in fall were Honeycrisp, and they're very good as well. Apples can be stored, depending on how you like your apples, I think if you like a nice, cool, crisp apple, store them in the fridge. They will last a little bit longer that way. And one last, last thing, never store your fruit in plastic bags. Get it out of those plastic bags as quickly as possible, and you'll notice that there are some cloth produce bags available in markets that are inexpensive, and while they're great to schlep back and forth to the store, they're actually more useful for your own personal storage at home. All right, great. Let me see if there's any more questions. All right, excellent. So I have two requests for lives. So here's the thing. I want to just give a little info in case I lose you, because I lost you last time I tried to go live. Um, our next show will be Saturday, October 7th. Again, we're going to go live the first and third Saturday of every month. So send in your questions. I can't wait to see you. I do not have a demo for this week, but please send me your demo suggestions, things you'd like to see, and I will, when I start setting up the show, I will make sure I get those in there. All right, let's see if I can, if we can get any of our bakers live. Um, ooh, so let's see if I can get this to work. But Chef Daniel's questions, any suggestions for pear tarts and pies? All right, no, the live isn't working, but Chef, I'm going to answer your question and then I will let you guys all get back to your kitchens so you can do your Saturday baking. All right, all right. pears. Chocolate pots to cray, a little bit of frangipane and then back to the mandolin super thin sliced pears 
You could also make a beautiful fruit pizza. I was on the developing team of Corner Bakery way back when, and we made, uh, we used regular pizza dough, caramel sauce, and then beautiful, perfect mandolin, very thin slices of pears in a hot oven. And if you have a pizza oven, then you can definitely use that. And that was fabulous. It was a wonderful seller. So um, those are two suggestions right there. And I have one more. Cornmeal, a pie crust with a little bit of cornmeal. Take out some of the flour, use a, a fine cornmeal or even a polenta to make the crust. And then the filling, consider pear slices poached in red wine with a little bit of thickener, maybe a little bit of cornstarch and, and some of the red wine just to let it glaze a little bit. Excellent, Chef. Thank you so much. That the question came from Chef Daniel, everyone. Chef Daniel asked for, that was one, two, three, right off the top of my head for suggestions for pear tarts. Pears are in season from May to September, or no, <laughs> September to May. Oh my God, time to wrap the show, everybody. And um, yeah, I guess so. And they are coming right on the heels of apples, so make sure you enjoy pears because they're really good and they're good for us too. Thank you everyone for joining me on today's live. I really appreciate your questions. And I promise by the 7th, I will have the permissions set up so that we can go, we can easily go live. And uh, I thank you for your patience on that. Send me your questions, enjoy your baking, stay healthy, safe and strong. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Happy baking. Bye.